Today's talk I've titled An Honest Mess. Um, mostly it's been preempted, uh, which is excellent by previous speakers, about being honest about uh, the fact that marriage is not perfect. One of the problems I come across quite a lot um, working with young Catholics and the new wave of interest in marriage is this projection of marriage, the beauty of marriage, the wonderful vision of John Paul II in the theology of the body, all of these wonderful projections of marriage. And unfortunately, what happens is you get an almost, I call it Catholic Disney um, <laughs> approach to marriage. So there's a kind of a, an understanding of marriage that is all of its good things, but, it, but when the young people get into a relationship and something doesn't quite work out perfectly in the first m month or week, usually, um, suddenly they feel like they are, they are failures, that they haven't lived up to that perfect vision. Um, and so many, well, five or six years ago now, I gave a talk to about 100 and something young people at a conference, which was about how hard marriage was. And I got told off um, by a number of people who said, you shouldn't discourage them from getting married. Now, I didn't, out of that talk, that's the least response I've ever had from anybody. And yet, in the, as in straight after it, Almost everyone was quite somber and didn't react to it, and some people told me off. But over the years, it's the one talk that keeps coming back, that young people keep coming up five, you know, six years later saying, I'm glad I heard that talk back then because I've been married for three years and I, I just keep remembering that I'm not weird if I have a problem. So I'm going to talk about what actually woke me up to it more recently. I thought I had it all under control. I thought I was an honest and open person, but something happened. Firstly, briefly, I want to talk about being a neighbour. I'm from the country. So I was born and raised. This is actually my home area. If you look down there, or if you could see over the next hill, you'd see my house where I grew up. So I grew up in this beautiful area. Now, one thing about the country is you're approximately, you know, four or five kilometres from the next person, but you know their business really well. You, and you toot them as you go past any time you meet them. In fact, if you forget to toot one day, they are, the phone's ringing as you walk in the door to say, what did I do? So there's a relationship there that's very strong in the country. Um, this is a picture of the general store in my hometown. It, this is actually taken in 2015. So you can see it's really advanced in the, in the last little while. The, the two young ladies outside the front there showing their mobile phones are bragging about the fact that they've just got mobile reception in my hometown. So. <laughs> So I come from this environment, very small, my, home, my school was 24 kids uh, in the whole school. You know, there's a whole kind of country feel to it. Now what's really interesting is when you get to the city and you're living very closely, we actually get much further apart. That we, the closer we get, the more barriers we build around our lives. We have every single, because I'm a country boy, I can't help it, every single neighbour who's moved in, we've taken a cake around, we've done all, you know, hello, we love to, and they avoid us very carefully from that moment onwards. They, you know, they are happy to say hello to the other neighbours, but they think we're the weird ones. Okay? They're almost terrified of that kind of intimacy, of someone knowing, being next door and hearing them shout at the kids or something like that, as if we're going to think they're freaks or something, that, until they've heard us. Um, now, I thought I was good at being open uh, and receiving help, and, and my wife and I, time to time, have had many crises, um, and, um, well, not many, a number, and we've needed help from outside, but something happened a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, um, let's see if I can get this to work. This is about uh, three years ago. It's my children, and uh, seven of our children and my wife. That is a fair picture. I mean, we always take the formal pictures, and then we say, okay, now you get to make faces. Um, and this is one of their muck around ones. It shows you roughly the kind of atmosphere is usually in our house. It's a very silly, goofy sort of atmosphere, and we, we enjoy it. Now, when, so when the, young, the next one showed up, this is them all looking at the ultrasound, uh, they're all fascinated by it, very excited to see the new baby, all except the youngest one, Beatrix, who's off raiding the fridge. She's taken the opportunity when she's not being guarded. Um, now, one of the things that my wife and I say to each other is, if you ever want to give God a laugh, tell him your five-year plan because what came next was Albert. Uh, there he is having, he's just born, he has just struggled, it was about a two day labor, um, struggling to breathe there. He was put into this um, ambulance and taken directly to uh, Westmead Hospital into intensive care. Um, if you're worried about medical images, you probably should leave at this point, so. Albert was, um, if I can get it to, there we go. 
Albert, this, oh, hang on. This is him. I came into his um, crib on his first day. Uh, he has, you can't see there, there's catheters into every limb. Uh, he has, later on, he gets one into his neck and he's got breathing apparatus over his nose. He's running uh, pretty much every kind of life support that's possible, um, except that at that stage, he hasn't got a tube to breathe down into his throat yet. Um, that was the night, that's the same day he was born, and because there was danger of him dying, he was baptised. I couldn't get hold of our regular priest, a, a dear friend who happens to be, um, have been ordained recently, he picked up um, the tab, if you like, and came rushing. He drove an hour um, flat out from, I think he was down in Cronulla, through uh, evening traffic to get to this. Uh, this is, and they, the nurses very kindly not only allowed me to have more than one visitor, uh, the, the other gentleman sitting there, is there was the person who'd already agreed to be godfather. Um, the staff brought out a little kit they had, and I wanted to show you this. I'm fleshing through this quite quickly because I want to talk about other things. Ah, go back. There is a guild of women who just make these baptismal garments and have them available in intensive care for people. I, I don't, I've never met them. I've never actually got around to thanking them because they just pulled this out of a, a cupboard, the nurses did, because it was what it's there for. And they did it precisely because they know that people in this situation aren't prepared. The, the last photo um, there was one of myself and uh, Susie, who, by the way, champion, eight births, and she walked out of the hospital after less than a day because she couldn't be separated from her baby who was already in another hospital. Came to see him. This is us on the second day round. But the first photo you saw actually went viral worldwide because a friend of ours in Melbourne, Matthew Price, has a prayer chain which he does via, via the internet and it hits 700,000 promises for prayer. Um, now, it's something I can't even fathom. I, I, mean, I asked people to pray. I put my blog out and said, please pray, and lots of people did. And there were lots of, about 1,000 people or so following it and praying, which we're very deeply grateful for. But then he just smashed it worldwide, and we still have people contacting us. Um, this is not working. <laughs> so here we go. So the children, this is a little bit of feeding. I'll point to the back, okay? Uh, a little poem my, one of my daughters wrote for Albert while he was in hospital. They didn't actually see him more than a couple of times because the first time they visited, which is one of the photos we skipped past, uh, five minutes before they got there, he had a cardiac arrest and there was all sorts of in things involved. They had to go out again, um, constantly dealing with things. This is them on the day he first came home, very delighted, and then, unfortunately, he went straight back into emergency a couple of days, well, a couple, about a week or so later, because um, pneumonia and heart failure. It was so bad that when he... Um, uh, they had to drill in, you can't see it there, but through his shin to get in, moisture into it. It was quite a traumatic situation. Uh, so there are certain... Uh, what I didn't realise is that parents in these situations suffer post-traumatic stress disorder, things like that as well. Um, I remember them offering me a social worker at this point when they were about to drill into his shin. And I thought, what? On what universe would a social worker make this better? Um, but... <laughs> this became... <laughs> We we're literally in emergency. <laughs> There's nurses and doctors all around us. Anyway, this is what we looked at for months, months and months and months. Now, I didn't see my wife for more than five minutes because we tag team, changed over, for about six months. Um, now, that does things to marriages. Um, so, there we go. That, however, is the site that I remember from that time. I can tell you every number on the screens. I can tell you what all of those machines do. I can tell you what all the drugs do. So I'm, I'm an academic, I researched everything. I couldn't let them put anything in my son without knowing what it was going to do. However, that site kept bringing me back. What, I have to show you that, come on. This, and the one before it, that. This is what happened at home. Food happened. And this is one shot of one meal. Yeah, that's one meal. We had food show up at our door every single day for four and a half months. We still don't know exactly who organised it. But for four and a half months, we had more food. We were giving food to other people, to charities, to other families. 
In fact, at one stage we put out a notice, please stop giving us food, we have no room in our fridge, and the next day someone delivered a fridge. <laughs> I'm serious, it's still, we still have a second fridge out the back, it's huge. We had to put it in the garage, it was bigger, and they said, stop complaining, here's some more. <laughs> now, what I'm trying to say is that we were tough. All the way through this, we wrote, I wrote lovely things on my blog, we wrote lots of things, we were very strong about it, we were very faithful, we prayed, we thanked everyone. Um, we kept our space very careful, privately, but when we came home one day and we found seven lasagnas stacked up outside our front door, my wife burst into tears and I burst into tears, and we didn't realize why. We had, well, she has, she showed me last night, she has a list of every single person who helped us up to that point. And then suddenly, we, we'd gotten beyond the point where we could thank people. And I realized we were working like an exchange. It was like as if we were gonna pay them all back someday. As if it's okay to receive a little bit of help, but no, no, we, you know, we, we, we're going to be thanking them, we're gonna do all the right things. And it was that point we realized there's no way we can ever pay anyone back. There's no way we can even know who's helped us, who's been around. And it was, I have to say, I know it sounds really weird, but it was humiliating. And I realized that I had been holding on to this illusion in myself that I was together and that we were together. And even though we had rough bits around the edge and we're quite honest about that, everything was going to work. And that we didn't really, you know, we just need a little bit of help. And then suddenly we realized we were totally reliant on other people's help. What I've noticed since, I mean, these are just the pictures. People came around to babysit. People did all sorts of things with the kids. One friend, dear friend, a priest, got to meet Pope Francis while he was in studying in Rome. He wrote this card to the Holy Father. Now, if you have a look at this photo, look at what all the other priests are doing. They're all trying to reach the Pope, as you would if it's the first time you've seen the Pope and possibly the only ever time you're going to all trying to reach over and touch the Pope and, hey, I, I look at me, I'm with the Pope. And what's Father Louis doing? He's got the card out and he's saying, Holy Father, please pray. Now, his one chance, his big thing, he gave it over to someone, to a child he hadn't met yet. I think the fact that the Pope prayed is awesome, but I think the fact that the priest gave over that time is impressive for me. What I wanted to say to you all is there is actually a stigma attached to um, asking for help. As much as we want to ask for help, and we think we are, there is actually a point at which you've got to actually break before you can ask for help. Some people made it easy to ask for help. Sometimes they just didn't say, they didn't take no for an answer. Sometimes they made it easy because they just did stuff. They didn't require anything emotional of us. They made it easy. Other times they made it easy because they were so genuine in wanting to help, not wanting to make themselves feel better. One of the things that's really awful about having a bad situation is when people show up at your door and then they want to tell you their story to show you how much they're empathising with you. What you need is to them not to talk, <laughs> to listen and to be there. Um, these are the three men who were at the cradle that time, and here they are at the, at the affirmation of baptism later around, the completion of it. Um, and I have to say we've had tremendous support from Bishop Fisher, who's a family friend, but also has spent a lot of time with us. Um, he was, in fact, apart from our good, my good friend uh, Sam, who was the, at the baptism, Bishop Fisher was almost the only priest who stayed in contact with us. Even our local parishes would find it very difficult to get a response from them. Um, so, this happy lad is now big enough to harass his brother doing homework. He's now a happy, actual, complete clown. He's still got many, many needs. It's still a trauma. It's still very much out there, but what he has taught us more than anything is to be vulnerable, that it's okay to ask for help and to let it happen. That's my quacker. Thank you. And 
so that's all. I'm finished now. But he, he, I want to finish on this note. Be gentle with people when you're trying to help them. Lots of people tried to force their way in. Lots of people tried to force help on us in ways we didn't want or was hard. I actually had to shoulder check, that is like full on shoulder charge, a Polish woman who was trying to get into our house to console my wife who didn't want to be consoled. But learning how to make it easy for people to take help, to dignify them in giving them help is actually a skill in itself. The people we learned most from, we didn't even notice until afterwards we realised they helped us and it didn't hurt. They helped us and we felt like it was just part of the, the deal, it was part of the routine, it was very dignifying. The people who made a big deal of helping us, who offered us help and made a big show of it, were actually harder to take help from. We need to be vulnerable enough in our own marriages, and that helps a lot when other people admitted their problems, but we need to teach other people that it's okay, it's safe to be vulnerable because we won't make a big deal of it. We just go on. Uh, in other words, it, that getting help from other people, like in the country, is ordinary, and it's good. Thank you.